Ephesians 5, 22 through 32 and 1 Peter 3, 7. We're in that series that we started last week, A Home Built to Last. And uh, this week we're going to look at the husband's rule, role, excuse me. Uh, we're going to do one on the parents at the end. So this is strictly about a husband's role in the home towards his wife, okay? That's what we're going to concentrate on today. Uh, if you remember last week, we started it, and we, Psalm 127.1 is what we launched the series with when the psalmist says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. And underneath that, that one verse is this reality. It is God who has created the world. He has created us. He is the architect of both our, li our very lives and, and how he wants us to live those lives. And the, the blueprints are the word of God. And we finished that up last week with Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Uh, we used Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Don't turn there. Uh, if you're here for the first time today, you might want to write down Psalm 127, 1, Genesis 2, 18 through 25. And then we looked at Matthew 7, 24 through 27, which is how Jesus ended the Sermon on the Mount. It was sort of his invitation, if you will, at the end of the sermon. And I'm just going to read those verses because to me, these Four verses are the key to unlocking everything else in your life if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, then the, the, the key starts with you receiving Christ. But if you're a Christian, the key to your life, unlocking everything. Remember the triangle. Lee, uh, do we still have that triangle back there? I, I'm sorry, Lee, I didn't ask you to have it. But for the rest of the series, if you'll just have it, in case I want to refer to it. Um, and I'll fill it in towards the end, but picture wife in one corner, husband in the other. Where are you farthest apart? Well, down at the bottom. Uh, well, if you want to grow closer to each other, what do you need to do? Well, we need to pursue Christ because the closer each of us gets to Christ, the closer we'll get as husband and wife. Okay? How do we do that? How do we get closer to Christ? Well, Jesus tells you in these four verses. I, I've said these... Uh, a zillion times at AFM, and I'll say them a zillion more. This unlocks everything. Here's what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount th that Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7 covers. He said a plethora of things, and then he summarizes everything he said in that Sermon on the Hill that day. He summarizes it by saying this, therefore, because of everything I've just said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Men, listen, because this is true for you. What kind of home are you building? Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, practice, some translations have practice, I like that word too, practice, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came. It didn't say if the rain comes. It's so important as a Christian, we, kept, we quit selling uh, our lost friends as we're trying to lead them to Christ, that we quit trying to sell them on this idea that, if, boy, if you come to Jesus, everything in your life's going to be great. That's not true. Right? You come to Jesus and you got a bad marriage, you still have a bad marriage. And let, let me say this to you. This is a rocky world. And coming to Jesus might make it worse in the beginning. You don't believe so? Read Matthew 10. You got rebellious kids and you come to Jesus. When you leave today, if you receive Christ today, you're going to go home to a family where you still got rebellious kids. If out of carnality and out of coveting you got more bills than you got money to pay those bills and so you're going to come down here and you're going to try Jesus when you leave your debt still going to be greater than your income well what what good is it then if I do Jesus well first off your issue is you think it's you that gets to determine where, where you stand with Jesus it's Jesus that gets to determine where you stand but if he calls you, if you understand through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is the ultimate treasure of life, then you enter into a relationship with him. Number one, 
you will have eternal life. Now weigh out the negatives of your life with the eternal. Right? I don't care how bad my life gets here, I'm going to live eternally with the Father and Son. Amen? And that's what allows me to handle the difficulties I'm currently in because I know when I die, I'm going to spend eternity with the Father and Son. So coming to Jesus is about you changing your, God to you changing your destination from hell to heaven. Second reason is now you're going to have within your life a power that you didn't have before you said yes to Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives us a dunamis power. It's the word we get dynamite from. Okay, you're going to have someone walking with you for the rest of your life. The Lord Jesus said at the end of Matthew 28, he says, Lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. So when you say yes to Christ, he, you are indwelt by his spirit. And I know if you're sitting here today and you've never really done that, you don't understand the blessing of it. But if you're saved and born again, you understand the blessing of having the presence of Christ in your life every single day. And if you come to Christ, if you surrender your life to Christ, your marriage might improve. Your relationship with your kids will improve. You'll start making sound financial decisions that will change your financial instability. So when Jesus says to you and me, if anyone hears these words of mine and acts on them, he may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came. That represents the storms of life, guys. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And we need to be honest with people, right? Walking with Jesus is going to bring storms that you didn't have before you walked with Jesus because now those storms are going to be called persecution, but when those storms come, because you are, your foundation is Christ, you're walking in his commands, when those storms come, you will discover, as all of us have who really walk with Jesus, that our house will not fall. For it had been founded on the rock. Men, listen to me. You want to change your home? It's going to come when you're changed. When you follow Christ. When you sit your family down and say, hey, starting today and for the rest of our life, I want you to know I'm going to follow Christ. And there are going to probably be uh, huge changes as to how we do life. They're going to be uncomfortable. You're not going to like some of them. But I am ordained by God to lead my home in a way that glorifies him. And so we're going to have to eradicate some of the stuff that we've allowed to go on here that doesn't glorify him. But in the end, you'll be blessed. But then he says to another part of the crowd, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And I told you, there are, the, the divorce statistics are as real in the church as they are in the world. And I read a statistic before last week that disturbed my very soul, that the greatest statistical reality of, of, of the church world, where is the highest percentage of divorce, they happen in what we call evangelical homes. Those that swear they love Jesus best. And yet our homes are crumbling. And I want to tell you, Satan's not a dummy. He knows if he can destroy homes, he'll destroy a community. If he can destroy the community, he'll destroy the state in our case. And if he can destroy the homes and the communities in the states, then he can crumble a nation. Amen. Rotted from the inside out. And we sit week after week in the church oblivious to this. Because until we practice 
the commands of Scripture in our life, until we hunger for Jesus, till we learn and we sit at his feet and he begins to reveal himself to us, we are not recognizing, we don't have the spiritual discernment to recognize the attacks of the enemy. How is he going to get us? Well, I don't know about you, Pastor, but man, I'm in Jesus. Satan can't really... Peter said he's as a roaring lion look, roaming to and fro from the earth. Now listen, he can't take my salvation. But if I don't walk with Jesus, he can destroy my marriage. Right now, if I choose not to walk with him, he can begin to crumble my marriage. So men, I'm starting with you. Because when creation happened, God started with the man. And then he took from man a rib and made woman. But God created the man first. And that doesn't make men more special. It just, I'm telling you that because I'm telling you that's why we're starting with the man. Now, let me say a couple qualifiers. Ladies, do not go home today nagging your man about everything he heard today. You will not change him. He will set his jaw, and he will not do it in, to spite you. And he might be sitting there thinking, woman, if you would do what you're supposed to do, it'd be easy for me to do, and then it's just a vicious cycle. Yeah, but if you do this, then I do that, and you don't do this, so I won't do that, and, and then, oh yeah, but you're not doing this, so I won't, and uh, it's called the crazy cycle. So let's look at Ephesians 5, 22 through 35. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself, Christ, being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands in some things in those things where he's absolutely right. Uh, in those things that he's proven that I should submit to. Is that how your Bible reads? You know what in the Greek means everything? <laughs> everything. Now, let's qualify that. If what your husband is asking you to do will make you violate the commands of God for your life, that's when you say no to him and say yes to God. You understand? But if it's not that, then ladies, I love you in Jesus. Be subject to your own husbands. Now, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the words of Christ, Romans 10, 17. That he might, he being Christ, might present to himself the church in all her glory. Think of a bride on her wedding day and her beauty. Get that image in your mind. Christ did all that he did in order that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So, in light of this, husbands, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh. And I know in that you look in the mirror and say, dude, I hate my flesh. That's not what he's talking about here. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. 
Because we are members, we there is the church, are members of his body. And we that are the church are not the fact that you sit in the church on Sunday or you have your name written on some uh, man-made role. The church are those that are the blood-bought children of God who, who through Christ's death and resurrection, they have placed their faith in the person of Christ. They've surrendered their life, the throne of their heart to Christ. It's those people that are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, and... That verse 32, when God will unlock that in your life, what Paul is saying is everything I've said in this passage, the metaphor is me and Trudy for Christ in his church. It's not, the metaphor is not Christ in his church for Trudy and I. No, our marriage is a metaphor for Christ and his bride, the church. And that's what Paul's saying there, this mystery is great, this unseen union between the body of Christ and Christ. He said, it's a great mystery. He said, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, even though the emphasis of this, what I've just said, is on the unseen union between Christ and his bride, the church, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Isn't it interesting that the last admonition that Paul gives in this section of Scripture to husband and his wife is that he's telling husbands, love your wife. He doesn't say that to wives. He says to wives, respect your husband. Husbands, love your wife. Wives, respect your husband. It is not as natural for men to be loving people. Can we just amen that? Ladies, I give you permission to amen that. Amen. Okay. Because it's just true. That's why the admonition is that uh, men would love their wives. And then tomorrow, next Sunday, ladies, you're to respect your husbands. I have seen more men browbeat down I've had women telling me that they would love Jesus more, but they are basically living with a jellyfish of a husband who is spineless. And I mean, the man's standing right there. His head bowed to the ground. And it rips my heart out. Because this woman doesn't understand the worst enemy she has to her husband being what he should be is her. And then I weep for men who allow themselves to be spineless jellyfish. And I just want to think, what has happened in your life that has allowed you to be spiritually spineless in the leadership of your home. I mean, what has beat you down? And in those kind of homes, they haven't practiced what Jesus taught. And that's why their homes are a mess. And if you're sitting here today and your home is a mess, can I love you well right here? and tell you the reason your home is in a mess is because you're not doing what Matthew 7, 24 through 27 tells us we must do, which is to practice the teachings of Christ. And by the way, well, you, you just mean on Matthew 5, 6, and 7 right now. Whose book is this? Huh? Come on, I just did a series. Whose book is this? It's, man, <laughs> you're all so scared, man. Oh, God, 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 I hope I'm right. And be confident, this is God's word, the inerrant, infallible word of God. This is the blueprints to your home. 
God created you, created the home. He gave us the blueprints. And because he knows us so well and he knows we'll never follow him on our own in our flesh, because in our flesh there's nothing in that man that seeks after the things of God. You know what God did because he loves you so much? He gave you his Holy Spirit. So now if you're in Christ, you're without excuse. What's the translation, pastor? No, it's not. If I could just find one, I understand. No, it's not. You are walking in faulty thinking. You are listening to people you shouldn't be listening to. You have within your own life, if you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God. Who 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, we've been given the Holy Spirit so that we might know freely, at no cost to us, the deep things of God. So husbands, if you're in Christ and you're not practicing the teachings of Christ in your life and in the life of your family, it's on you. Well, she won't listen. That's a her and Jesus problem. Are you listening to me? That's a her and Jesus problem. But I'll tell you this, men. It's been very few women that have ever not subjected themselves to a husband who is loving them the way Christ loved the church, that he gave his life for her. And when men start to lay their life down for their wives, women begin to trust in that kind of love. And then there's just some wicked women. (laughs) Just some women that are wicked. And they need to be saved. And husbands, I feel for you. Because you're in for a long, hard row. And can I say a word to single people real quick? Kaylee, Kaylee Krieger. (laughs) This is God speaking to you through me. I love you, Kaylee. Kaylee, Kaylee, shut up. Don't speak. Young ladies, you are picking the wrong young men to attach yourself to. If I ask most young ladies in this room, tell me the qualities you want in your dude. He's got to be cute. He's got to have a sense of humor. He's, he's got to like long walks on the beach holding hands. He has to like listening to the rain cuddled up. By the way, I like all those scenes. But anyhow, <laughs> I do. I truly, I do. But, but I'm a romantic, sorry. And you know what never makes their list when I ask him? If he loves Jesus. Because can I let you in on a secret, ladies? Men who really aren't in love with Jesus, you're getting the best version of them right now. I mean, right now when you're dating them, that's the best version. They'll even come to church with you. Oh, you love Jesus? You want J-E-S-U-S. I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? They're trying to win you like it's a sporting contest. Until they get across the goal line, Chuck, which is the marriage altar. And that man you thought you had, then when you get home six weeks later, it is like you had a bait and switch happen, ladies. Like, who is this dude? And what'd you do with my husband, my man? So young ladies, listen up. I'm going to tell you three 
spiritual qualities that every man should possess before you ever say, I do. In fact, don't even date them. You know, it's the most heartbreaking statement I ever hear from young ladies. Oh, I'm dating so-and-so. Oh, man, does he love Jesus? Well, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, you are. Because that should have been the first thing out of his mouth, amen? I mean, if he loves Jesus, he ought to be trying to find out if you love Jesus. Well, we'll get around to that. Right now, we're just, you know, hanging. We're, we're just talking. <laughs> okay. Well, now you're talking, and later you'll be crying. Vogue 17 and any other of those goofy magazines are not the Bible. They do not know what they're talking about. Put them down, burn them, have a, have a magazine burning. And start listening to the architect who created you and gave us his blueprints. That's all I'm going to say to you, Kaylee. <laughs> but I bet you listen now. Kaylee loves Jesus. Man, I'm just joking. That's why I picked on you, Kaylee, because you love Jesus. Don't go home and tell your mom and dad, oh, man, I could believe you. It's because I love you. Three things I want to give you today real quick. You ready? Men, listen. Un uncommitted young ladies or older ladies, you ought to write these three things down as I give them to you. Because if they don't exhibit this before you're married, you ought not even like date them, get rid of them. I'm lonely. I, I understand that. Give yourself to Jesus. He'll take up all that loneliness. Because sometimes God is not bringing a man into your life because you're not prepared to be the wife you need to be. So why would God put a man in your life? Men, sometimes God is withholding that woman you're looking for for your life because you are not the man you need to be. So why would God direct one of his young ladies that love him into a relationship with a man who is not practicing the teachings of Christ? So you know what we do. We take matters in our own hands and we join all the apps and, uh, you know, uh, to find us a man, find us a girl. And, I, and by the way, if I was 15, 16, 19, 20, 20, I'd, I'd do Christian dating apps. I wouldn't even think about dating them until I got to know them inside and, uh, inside and out, like in terms of w what they think, how they act and all that. So I, I think those apps are great. A lot of lying goes on in those apps. <laughs> Be prepared for that. A lot of men want a godly woman as long as she leaves him alone. Three things. If a man, if a husband's going to be productive in his role as husband and homes built for last, that last, homes built that last, there are going to be three things. Well, probably a lot of subcategories, but three major things. Now, and again, we're launching from the aspect that this man is a child of God. If you're here today and you're lost as a man, um, your, your need is not this. Your need is Christ because right now you are dead in your trespasses and sins and you need, a, a, you need life and that only comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But if you're a believer today, these are three things, men, that you need to have in your life. Number one. Number one, if you're going to be a husband that, that walks with the Lord well and leads your family well, you have a call from the architect to spiritually love your wives. Look at Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives. Go home. Men, have you ever thought if you sat down with your wife today at the kitchen table... And you said, sweetheart, I'm giving you permission today to hurt me, to crush me. Am I loving you well? Would you have the courage to say that, to ask that question of your spouse? Am I loving you well? I wonder what they'd say. The command, Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives. 
just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. The command that Paul gives us, or the Holy Spirit through Paul in Ephesians 5, for husbands is husbands, love your wives. Now, the love that's used in the English there is the word agapo. It is the, the agape love of God, our church. Uh, agape family ministries. Agape, the love of God. We want to operate in that. Uh, uh, ministries is what we want to do because we love God. And then uh, agape family, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, family is because we are one family in Christ, one body in Christ. And so husbands, the command of God for your life is that you will love your wives with the agape love of of God. If you are born again, men, you have this love inside you. Did you know that? It's there. And ladies, you might be sitting there thinking right now, well, you know, pastor, um, I know uh, you say it's there, but I haven't seen it in about 10 years. I I'd be all for him loving me with the agape love of God. Uh, Romans 5 says this. I'll, I'll read it real quick. You ready? Romans 5, starting verse 1. I, I don't know who's back there. Who is back there? Hey, Dan, if you can get there real quick. Therefore, having been justified by faith, which is how anyone enters the family of God, we have peace with God uh, through, our Lord, through our Lord Jesus Christ. In that one thing is the gospel, right? Uh, we're justified by faith. Faith in what? In the Lord Jesus Christ. When we have that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have now, uh, uh, we are now at peace with God through Jesus, through whom Jesus also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Do you exult in your tribulations? Uh, 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 Paul writes in verse 3 that, that because we uh, are justified faith, through Christ, we have, we have peace with God. Did you know if you're here today and you're not saved, right now you're at enmity with God, which means that you're at war with God, whether you know you are or not. If you stay in that condition till the day you die, you are going to perish uh, because of that enmity uh, that you have with the Lord because you have rejected the only way anyone's ever going to have peace with God, which is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says not only in, at, at this... Not only, you know, because through this faith into this grace in which we stand positionally, we stand in grace, the unmerited favor of God. We stand in that positionally. I'm saved. Uh, I, I have a positional sanctification because I've said yes to Jesus. I've given Jesus my life. And, 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 and because of that, when God looks down, even though I'm imperfect and I am, uh, boy, I'm a mess, uh, he sees the blood of his son upon my life, and I'm at peace with God because of that. Isn't that wonderful? And, and, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Why, why should we exult in our tribulations? He, he's going to answer it for you. Uh, uh, he, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. So if you've been praying to God, oh God, help me with my patience. Do you know what you're asking God to bring into your life? Tribulations. The only, way you, the only way you learn patience is having to be patient in tribulations. I ain't never praying that again. That's what you're saying right now, right? I, I, I'm not real good on that patience thing, but I'm good, God. I'm good. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because, here it is, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life, you have the fruit of the Spirit. You know what else you got? You have the very agape love of God that's been poured into you by God through the Spirit. So men... If we are not loving our wives with the agape love of God, one of two things is true about us. One, we're not born again. There are more people sitting in church every week in America that are religious lost. They think they're Christians because they say so. When in fact, they've never, ever 
surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. They prayed a prayer. They got dunked. Now, woman, get off my back. I jumped through the church stuff for you. No. No. Listen to me. I said something week one, and, and I wasn't trying to brag, and it's bothered me all week. I wasn't. I was trying to make a point, and I think I, I lost the point with words. I have a great marriage. When I say great marriage, I don't talk about perfect marriage because Trudy's married to me, so it can't be perfect. <laughs> My baby's got like that Mary Poppins bag. You know what I mean? Where she just keeps pulling out all this great stuff. She's got this measurement. Mary, I love that movie. Mary Poppins pulls it out. Oh, let's measure you. And, pulls, and, and so it gets to her and it's, uh, uh, what is it that Mary Poppins, that, that tape measure says something about almost perfect in every way. Well, when you pull my tape measure out, it don't say that. I'm forgiven in every way. Amen. Praise God for positional grace. How on earth, Pat, could God take me who grew up in a broken home? My dad left my mom and the seven kids. I was maybe two or three, and he rolled on us and abandoned us. My mom hated men, literally hated men, because her father was abusive, her husband was abusive, and so her only idea of what a man looks like was the father and the husband, and it made my mom very bitter towards males. So that's the environment I grew up in. My mom favored the girls and really couldn't stand us. She favored the girls so much that when she moved to Colorado, she took the girls and shipped boys off to a dad that we never even knew. I moved into a stranger's house who drank himself to sleep every night. He was an alcoholic. That was my experience growing up. How do you get from that to having a great marriage today? Being the husband that I know that I am? I know that I am. I'm not perfect, but I'm a good husband. I know I'm good because the Word of God tells me what I should measure my husband stuff with. And I'm, I'm, I can amen that stuff. I'm not a phony husband. Man, I... I love my wife. When I laid awake the night before my wedding, I, laid awake, I stayed up all night staring at the ceiling. I was sharing a hotel room with my best man, Les, and, and the whole night I just stared up at the ceiling. And here's what I basically had to talk with God like on, on, on a loop. God, I've ruined everything I've ever touched. God, there is not one thing I can point to in my life that I've succeeded in. Even my salvation, God, is because you took pity on me and through your grace and mercy, you chose to save me. And God, if you don't take over for me, I will wreck this marriage. It will not survive. You know how I know that, God? Because nothing I've ever touched has survived. I didn't know what a husband was supposed to be. I didn't have any model. How do you get from there to who I am today? It is by surrendering the control of your life, men, to the Lord Jesus Christ and practice his teachings and let him begin to take over your life and to shape you into the man that he wants you to be. That is the journey, and it's the journey for every man. Now, some of you had great models of dads and husbands. I didn't have any. Not, not, only, did I, 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 not only was he not a good model, he, he abandoned us. And I wasn't perfect the day I got saved, but as I continued my journey with Christ, put that triangle back up, as I began my journey with Christ, even before I got married, and I knew that Christ was my treasure, and that a pastor told me that through the Word of God, I will know Christ, I'll be able to worship Christ, I'll be able to love Christ well, and so I began that journey up the triangle on my side, and he began to take out the garbage and cultivate his character in my life so that when I met Trudy, very imperfect, 
We began a journey because she grew up in the Christian home, had a great dad. You talk about pressure. I had to follow her dad, man, who was maybe the most godly man I ever met in my life. And, I, and I'm, I'm to follow that? Seriously, man, I'm like, she's going to look to me to be like her daddy. And I don't measure up. So we got married. And we began to pursue Jesus as individuals. And the more we pursued Jesus, the closer we got to each other. It is the inevitable spiritual outcome for a husband and wife who pursue Jesus. You won't have to have 10 books on marriage. You've got the architect's book on marriage. Let Jesus have the throne of your heart. He'll teach you how to act, what to say, what to do in your marriage. You know why he wants you to succeed in your marriage? Because marriage is God's institution. Satan is trying to mar his highest creation, which is humanity. Every institution God has created, Satan wants to try and wreck. So you think God cares about marriages? You know why he said he hates marriage, Malachi? I hate divorce. Well, a lot of reasons. One of the, one of the foundational reasons because marriage is God's institution and we're screwing it up royally in the church. Because we don't touch the blueprints. Are you listening? So the command is to love our wives. But the qualifier to the command in Ephesians 5 is this. Because men don't grow up understanding how to love their wives. Well, we just don't. We don't. You know that old goofy saying, a man, you know, woman's trying to get the man to, hey, man, I told you I loved you at the altar. If it changes, I'll let you know. Do you know how that would crush a wife's spirit? There's no wife in here right now that says, I wish my husband loved me well. So, so what love, men, are we to model our love for our wives after? Easy, look. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself. So we see a command that we're to love our wives with the agape love of God, which by the way, Romans 5 has said, is shed abroad in our hearts, Pat. So we're without excuse. If you're born again, you're without excuse if you're not loving your wife well, because God has placed within you everything you need. You have the Holy Spirit that'll tell you when the meter's going the wrong way, right? If you're not loving well, he's gonna let you know. And God has placed within us his agape love. And then he qualifies the love by saying to us men, if in case we're confused about what it means to love our wives, Paul gives us the Holy Spirit through Paul gives us the qualifier, which is just as, just as, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So we had the command and we had the qualifier. Now underneath the qualifier are these things. Number one, it's a sacrificial love. John 15, 12 and 13, Jesus says to his disciples, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends which is what Jesus did for you and I. First John three sixteen, John wrote this. He said, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And if it's for the brethren, shouldn't it be for our spouse? It's a sacrificial love, men. You place the needs of your wife before your own. I didn't learn that quite. I've shared this story. I'll share it real quick. I am a, I grew up in a horrible home, as you know, and so sports were everything to me. It was my escape from reality. I played them all day long, and when I'd come home, the one thing I shared with my mom was the love for the Cleveland Browns. My mom was ate up with her love for Cleveland Browns. So on Sunday, the only happy moments of my childhood was when we were watching a Browns game. And I grew up, and that was like, that was like, the big thing, well, Trudy grew up in a home where the dad didn't care about sports. And so for her, sports is 
nothing. Our first great conflict in our marriage was I wanted to watch sports, a lot of them, because sports to me represented my happy space growing up. Trudy got very frustrated with me because when I say I watch sports, I watch sports. This is before DVRs. So you had to watch them live. I thought it was the greatest invention when we had VHS tapes. Then I could tape it. One day, Trudy says to me, you love sports more than me. When I heard that in my brain, it was nonsense. Because, of course, I love you more than sports. Duh. And maybe for you, man, it might be cars or whatever your hobbies are. And when your wife says to you, you love that more than me, it is her crying out for agape love. And when I realized how serious she was that I was somehow conveying to her by my actions. By the way, men, words are cheap. Go ahead, ladies. I give you another name, amen. This is your chance. Words are cheap, man. They don't mean nothing. If your words aren't backed up by your actions, they don't mean anything. Man, if you never come home, how long do you think your wife's going to accept that you love her? By the way, ladies, that's true of you too. And you've already said amen, so. So I quit sports cold turkey. They didn't have a therapy group. I probably would have gone to it. Hi, I'm Jim Wyrock, and I'm a sportsaholic. Anybody got a radio? I did. I stopped it. Because I was a babe in Christ. I was young. I was growing. I didn't want my wife thinking that about me. Remember, I'd already admitted to God I'd screwed up everything I've ever had. My wife was making this declaration to me that was, it crushed my heart that my wife could think like that. So I stopped it. Sports are gone, man. Because I do love you more than sports and I need to show it. So sometime later, I don't know how long it was, baby. It was quite a while. She was home, I come in from school or something. And she's, do you remember this, baby? You do, don't you? And she said, knitting or crocheting, whatever she was doing. She said, isn't there a Braves game on tonight? I'm like, Satan, get thee behind me. <laughs> if Jesus could say it to Peter, I could say it to my wife, right? Said, you trying to mess me up? I think I did say something like, man, babe, babe, I'm an addict. <laughs> I was confused for a second, like, is this like a test? Right? Like, and here's what my wife said to me. Listen to me, man. Babe, I never cared about you liking sports unless and until it so dominated your life that you love them more than me. So then we, I slowly integrated some of the things back into my life, but always with the understanding, I can't put this above my wife. You see, it wasn't that it was bad, man. It wasn't that cars are bad, sports are bad, whatever your hobby thing is. But when you allow it to trump your wife, which should be the most meaningful relationship on this earth. You've got a problem. And if that is true of you today, and I dare you to go home and sit your wife down and say, baby, is there anything you see above me? If you have any courage, you ought to ask her that. And ladies, if he ask you that, make sure the kids are out of the room. And you be real with him. Pastor, all you're going to do is create a fight. Listen to me, I don't know how you change unless you first admit there's a problem. Right? All those 10 steps, 12 steps, 19 step programs, what, what do they all start with? 
First step is what? What is it? Boom. Because why would you do the other nine steps? You're only going to do them if you know you got a problem. And we... Men, we are not the best gauge of whether we have a problem. It's those around us. Because the greatest deception is self-deception. We can talk ourselves into and out of anything we want. But the people that love you best, they're the ones that can tell you we have a problem. John MacArthur says about sacrificial love, and I'm just going to stop here. A Christian's loving with Christ kind of love is not based upon the attractiveness of the one loved, but on God's command to love. Can I say that again? Listen to me. Listen to it. A Christian's loving with Christ kind of love, or we could insert their agape love of God, is not based upon the attractiveness of the one loved, but on God's command to love. A husband is not commanded to love his wife because of what she is or is not. He is commanded to love her because it is God's will for him to love her. It is about the commitment of your will. Feelings and emotions, if you start with those, they will run you aground. And ladies, I love you so much in Christ. Nobody needs to crucify that more than the ladies in this room. Because you're so driven by feelings. And, and by the way, feelings and emotions are good things. But they ought to come after the commitment of your will. I'm going to love my imperfect wife well. She's got nothing to do with that. Can't she make it easier? Yeah, but I got my own flesh. See, what you got to do to love her well is crucify you. And God's love that he shed abroad in my heart, I did not get it because I was worthy of it. I got it because he was worthy and he loved me. Do you li are you listening? And so now the love I'm going to give Trudy, which is the agape love of God, Romans 5, this has been shed abroad in my heart and I am going to love her well. And if I'm going to love her well, if that's the commitment of my will, then my feelings and emotions will eventually catch up to the commitment of my will. But the problem we have in marriages is we've let our feelings and emotions uh, lead us and what, that's how divorces happen because our feelings and emotions are so subject to having everything perfect and when it's not perfect, it crumbles. It's a commitment of your will. That's why Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, Dan, if you can pull that out. We're stopping here, so don't freak out. You know why I go so long, man? I get one shot at you a week. You understand that? So I've got to cram as much as I can into that one shot. Because ladies, I want your husbands to love you well. Men, I want your husbands, your wives to love you well. I'm just giving you the blueprints. Are you listening? I'm giving you the blueprints. And he, Jesus, was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. You see anything in there about feelings and emotions that should drive us to follow Jesus? You know what he's saying? We've got to die to us. We've got to make a willful decision that I'm going to die to me. He must deny himself and take up his cross 
daily and follow me. Can I ask you something? If you know anything about the cross, exactly when do you think you're going to wake up with feelings and emotions that will drive you to pick up a cross? Which is why most of us aren't picking up the cross. We're waiting for our feelings and emotions to kick it in for us. They never will. I wake up every day with two overriding thoughts. How do I honor Jesus? And how do I honor my wife? Men, I literally wake up with that every day. How do I honor Jesus? And how can I honor my wife today? Well, it's easy for you. You got Trudy. Dude. Dude. It's a commitment of my will. I'm going to honor her today. Any way I can. If it's as little as setting a coffee pot so that every morning when she wakes up, she stumbles to the kitchen and turns it on. At the end of her night, if it's something as little as turning down a bed because one night I had done it and I heard her from the living room and she was in, oh, that is so nice. Boom. It's in there like, like a steel trap. And I get mad when she knows I'm hurt and she'll sneak in there and do it. I'll walk in the bed, babe. Baby, you are hurting. No, I really get frustrated with that because I'm going to honor my wife. I'm going to love my wife. I'm going to figure out what makes her tick, who she is, why she is. And I'm going to do my best so that my wife and her countenance is one of joy because she's got a husband that is honoring her, loving her with the agape love of God. And it starts at being sacrificial. I got I to gotta place my wants behind what she desires. Doesn't it get old? When I'm in my flesh, it gets very old because my flesh wants its way. And that's how one of the ways I can tell whether I'm in my flesh if it grinds me. Flesh, flesh, flesh. Really? One of the barometers of my, how well I'm sacrificing, living a sacrificing love for her is am I grinded by her not doing, her not uh, appreciating it, her not saying what I did when I got the new bar of soap out for the shower. So the next time she got in, she had this fresh bar and said that little microscopic thing. Man, I'm not kidding you. Listen to me. I walk around my house saying, how can I honor my wife? You know where I get that from? The blueprints for a home that's built for la to last. We're on year 39. How did a boy like me get to be the man I am? All glory to Christ. And a spirit that lives within me because he shows me in the Bible how I'm supposed to be. And man, I'll just say this in closing and we'll pick it up next week. <clears throat> This love, this agape love of God, it's not yours, it's God's in you. You gotta commit your will to doing it. It's a commit, it's not feelings and emotions. It's a commitment of your will. I'm going to lay my life down for my wife because I'm to love her as Christ did the church and he gave himself up for her. And when men, you feel underappreciated, and some wives will make you feel that way. They'll just start taking it for granted. They'll take advantage of you because now, man, you're doing everything. Now they're on their little throne while you're doing everything. Her reaction to my action can never drive my further action. Are you listening to me? Her reaction to my action cannot be the thing that dictates my next action. Do I want to be appreciated? Yes, and she does a marvelous job. 
But do I quit if she doesn't? Who am I doing it for? I am commanded of Scripture to love my wife. And I've been given the qualifier as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. Jesus said, there is no greater love than this, that a man would lay his life down for his friends. Well, if he'd do it for his friends, shouldn't he do it for his wife? Do you understand, men, the number one relationship in your life is your wife? Kids are going to grow up and leave. You know, there are, there are, there are adults that been married 30 years that get divorced. I never understand 30 years and now you're going to get divorced. They had built their whole life around their kids. When the kids left, they didn't have anything in common. They looked at each other and like, you're a stranger to me. Not me. Nah, I told Trudy, no, no, no. And them kids left. Best years of our marriage are right now. <laughs> we love being empty nesters. Don't get me wrong. I love my kids. Nice to visit. I'm a four-hour poppy. I can do about anything for four hours. Then you got to come get them. We say no sometimes to our kids and grandkids. No, we won't keep them tonight because we're going to do an in-house date. I wonder if your kids get, sure, they get mad at me. I don't care. My number one relationship on this planet is my wife. It's not my kids. It's not any of you. It is my wife. And I know what the blueprints teach me about how to love my wife. And I don't care when men make fun of me. Oh, you know, Jim going to have to ask his wife. <laughs> I lead my home. But I'm going to tell you how to lead your home the way Christ led your home. It's not in a recliner barking orders. It's laying your life down and washing the feet of those under you. You understand me? I laugh at that. Because you know what I know? The wife they're going home to is not near as happy as my wife is. And she's my number one relationship on this earth. And I'm her number one relationship on this earth. I love my kids. I love my grandkids. It's her. It's her. Men, are, can you say that with a straight face before God who would be listening to you? That you are living your life in such a way that it is demonstrable to your wife that she's the number one relationship in your life. That you are laying your life down for her. And that's more than just going to work and bringing a paycheck home. And we'll learn that next week. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I am an imperfect man that preaches a perfect standard every single week. I've not arrived. I'm not perfect. Every day though, God, I, wanna, I want your Holy Spirit to continue to carve out the character of your son. And because I know the number one relationship I have on this earth is my wife. And I understand that, that the great mystery is is that I'm to demonstrate Christ before a world with how I love my wife so they might get some idea of how he loves his bride, the church. It matters to you, God, whether or not we're execu executing your blueprint. It matters. God, I know that if Satan has his way, when people leave here today, they are going to, he's going to try and snatch all of this truth out of their hearts. I know there will be wives that leave here today thinking, oh, how great would it be? And we'll leave tonight, go to bed tonight broken when a husband hadn't even asked to talk. Lord, on behalf of those wives, I pray for them. And I pray for their husbands. Oh, God help men to understand it is a commitment of the will. It is not the butterflies you got when you dated your wife. It is a commitment to wake up every day to die to self, live for Jesus, and love our wives with the agape love of
God. And men, maybe if we didn't know it before, we know it now. Romans 5 makes it clear if you're in Christ, if you're justified by faith and positionally you've experienced God's grace, then his love has been shed abroad in your heart. The only question is, are you operating in it? And then what are you going to do when you leave here, men? Father, Jesus made it so clear in John 7. The wise man is he who hears and practices his teachings. Because storms are going to come to every marriage, to every family. Inevitably, we live in a fallen world. We, we battle our own flesh and that of our spouse. Life is hard. Jesus was admitting life is going to be hard. But if you will love me, serve me, surrender to me, here's what I promise you. I'll create a home for you that will stand against the storms of life. Jesus, I know some will go out of here. And the minute they hit that door, they won't think one more minute about this. And those men are building on sand. And one day, the storms of life is going to crush their home. Because storms reveal your condition. They don't make your condition. They just reveal it. I love you. Thank you for saving a wretch like me. And I promise till the day I die, I will never quit telling people about your great love as seen through your son, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, speak to these people as they leave. Speak to husbands, speak to wives. And help us men to have ears to receive what the Holy Spirit might speak to us through our wives today. It's difficult, it's hard. But growth only happens through going through the difficult moments. Hand in hand. I pray this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.